Robert Kofka in 1979. I had been introduced to his work by Henry Gelsel, who was my first boss at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. One day he just came into my office and said, get your coat, we're going down to look at art. I went to Semaphore Gallery and saw the show and I was knocked out. I was just sort of smitten from there. Robert and I had this kind of like mutual admiration, volatile relationship. I mean, he was a black male a generation older than me, a black female who'd come up through the 60s and 70s. So we had a lot of different ideas about things. But he was always, you know, like very thoughtful, you know, like about things, very knowledgeable. This was like the moment where he was coming into the new museum sphere with Marsha Tucker's Not Just for Laughs exhibition, figuring out what it was to be on the East Coast. It was like a complex thing for him. I think with regard to the whole black artist scene here in New York at the, by the late 70s, there had been pitch battles, not only with the mainstream for recognition, but also among black artists themselves about what was the appropriate stylistic mode and what was the appropriate political stance an artist should have. This way of living with a humor and satire is totally different from what you would see on the East Coast. And I think it really has to do with the particular time that Bob landed back in California after this sojourn in Egypt in the early to late 60s. So I think that that was really a kind of lightning rod, you know, for people on the East Coast. He could take a kind of issue or stereotype about a group of people, you know, Indians, black people or something, and put it out there before you could get to it. Or put it out there in a way that it exposed your racism because you would have thought that's the way this would happen. I was really attracted to the transgressive nature of the work. I got a lot of flack you know, for my support at Coast Garden. It reached ahead in 1984 when an article I did for Art Forum became the cover <laughs> article. And guess who's on the cover? George Washington Garver crossing the Delaware with all the really blatant stereotypical images of blacks just cavorting in the same boat with George Washington Carver. Are these the type of people who are going to be the ones to lead the revolution, you know, for, you know, African Americans in this country? An interesting question. Mm -hmm. Cole Scott's attitude towards women is very much of his generation. A lot of voyeuristic compositions, pinups, all his temptations, if you want, all out there. I think if you put it in the context of when it was happening and who he was and when he was painting them, it makes sense. The sequence of the Bather series is really sort of talking about the fight for the black and brown woman to sort of maintain her hegemony and her self-image against the onslaught of what society is throwing at you in terms of, you know, bosomy blondes and, you know, Breck girls and Marilyn Monroe and things like that. His subject matter gets to talk about the challenges of history when you go beyond a kind of linear Eurocentric one. Bringing in characters and incidences and perspectives that complicate the ideas. Crowding the figures into the, the compositions. In one painting you can have 10 different vignettes of what's going on. But at the same time, it's visual unity. From the beginning he was always about painting. Even though it got very sparse in the 70s, that impulse to paint was always there. Organizing this show was like a sense of completion. Previous surveys of his work were these 10 year increment. The ability to bring in the early work that people had never seen. It's a coda for this long term involvement. I'm glad I hung in there. And immensely thankful for the new museum for bringing it to New York.